I'm uh, Bobby Starr, Senator from Essex Orleans County. And uh, we have with us this morning the Ag Committee. And I'd like to uh, start with uh, our Vice Chairman, Senator Pearson. We could introduce ourselves and then we'll go to Anson and go uh, around the, the room. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris Pearson from Chittenden District. Glad to be back. Uh, this is the first time since I've been in the Senate that I get to be on a committee two sessions in a row. So uh, I'll be, I'm glad to be mostly up to speed. Look forward to working with you. You were that bad before. I thought, see, I liked your work, so you made it twice. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Back, glad to be back on the committee. Senator Brian Collimore representing the Rutland District. This is my third term on Senate Ave. Uh, Corey Parent, I represent Franklin County. Uh, I'm the new member on the committee, but I spent last biennium on uh, Senate Natural Resources. Um, and then prior to that, I spent two terms in the House, but never on an Ag committee. And uh, so, uh, Secretary Tabbitt, uh, would you like to take over sure. from here? Well, thank you, uh, Senator Starr and committee members. Uh, welcome, Senator Parent, to the committee. Um, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, we look forward to a productive and a safe session. Of course, uh, we stand ready to help you with your work, uh, crafting policies that improve the lives of Vermonters. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to introduce some of our directors. Uh, they will be your key contacts uh, for a variety of issues, whether it's uh, protecting animal health, making sure our food is safe, protecting our waterways, or improving the agriculture economy uh, from farm to table. Uh, they're there. Uh, they'll get you the information that you need to make your decisions. And of course, uh, lean on them. They are solid managers who understand their fields of expertise. Over the last four years, we worked closely with all of you uh, on the best approach to each issue with uh, common sense, uh, facts, and an attitude of how do we get to yes. And I think that's important. That's worked for all of us. Um, how do we get yes uh, uh, for the people of Vermont? Uh, a few highlights I I'd like to share with you since we last left you in our, our virtual world. Uh, across the agency, we've been focused on the current uh, pandemic. Uh, we're doing our best to keep everyone safe and healthy. Our ag agriculture community has stood tall, working nonstop to feed all of us. And we are so thankful for their work, whether it's on the farm, uh, in the orchard, the slaughterhouse, or in the processing plants, or in our stores. Uh, agriculture remained open and is open as we weave our way through this uh, pandemic. But we're also working nonstop to improve the economy. Uh, we have just completed a historic uh, program uh, that provided nearly $26 million in grants, $26 million in grants, sending out dollars to hundreds of businesses uh, so they could pay their bills uh, through this pandemic. Your work, uh, which allowed us to do our work, uh, was critical, and we thank you. Um, you helped uh, Vermonters. A few highlights, uh, just a little more details on that. Uh, the outreach was incredible on this. Uh, the agency provided direct technical, uh, direct technical assistance uh, via phone or email to approximately 6,500 businesses and partners about the various applications. And we produced 12 weekly newsletter e-blasts uh, with much of the content related to the grants, uh, receiving more than nearly 39,000 opens uh, by those recipients. So they're reading it. Again, we, we want to thank our partners in this. Um, the agency collaborated with uh, VHUB and the Farm Viability Network. Uh, those advisors uh, helped with the applications, gave advice, and uh, they assisted more than 520 working lands businesses, including nearly 400 businesses that re -support, uh, received support through the uh, grant applications. So we couldn't have done it without their, their help. They uh, helped farmers night and day to get through the applications and get uh, as much money to the field as possible. Uh, we think, and we've done the data on this, the grants, uh, 1,136 businesses uh, received uh, nearly $26,000 uh, 
uh, toward mitigating the business impacts uh, experienced due to this pandemic. Um, we are in the process of gathering additional uh, data and the industry needs and impacts of the grants, and we'll share a more detailed report in the coming weeks uh, with you, um, probably later January or February. Um, Abby Willard, our Director of Agriculture Development, is working on that report to get uh, more details to your work. We know our work is not done here. We know there's still some needs and there's some gaps. Uh, we have to examine uh, meat processing. Our slaughterhouses have uh, not stopped working and have been in overtime uh, since this began in March. Uh, they do need some support with uh, labor and also infrastructure. Uh, so stay tuned on that. The latest federal CARES program uh, does offer dollars for small and medium sized facilities, uh, but it's too early to tell where Vermont is gonna fit in in that. Uh, but those uh, would be coming from USDA and we'll keep posted on that as soon as the new administration is um, in place uh, down in Washington with that. But that's encouraging part of this uh, latest round of CARES dollars did include for small and medium sized facilities. Um, over the summer, I've had discussions with the governor uh, about the future of agriculture. Uh, governor Scott has instructed me and all of us at the agency to look deeper and over the coming weeks, you'll hear more from us on long-term strategies to grow our agriculture economy. We know it's critical to Vermont's future. So stay tuned, we'll be back with more details on that. Some of the other things just quickly, I uh, wanna highlight that, uh, that are going on uh, with us. The agency has launched the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center. This came after the agency's Dairy Summit. I think many of you attended that. Um, in Orleans County in Jay in April of 2019. Uh, we sought funding and were successful with a $6.5 million grant from USDA. Our thanks to the delegation and Senator Leahy who are partners with us knowing we need to improve the dairy economy. The center is one of three centers around the country. The center provides our farmers with uh, technical assistance, contracts and grants supporting cow, goat, and sheep dairy businesses as they look to improve their bottom line. Our dairy farmers are always adapting and changing to the markets and this center uh, focused at the agency is focused on new strategies. We also look uh, at ways to improve the environment. Our farmers are on the front lines and have invested millions over the last few years on conservation projects that are protecting our new waterways uh, from runoff. Uh, we will launch soon a new program uh, with the help of USDA and RCS. In short, it's called Pay for Performance. The $7 million grant awarded to the agency will give monetary incentives to go above and beyond Vermont's stringent environmental regulations. Uh, we are excited to launch this project this year with Vermont farmers and partners. The Vermont Land Trust is also focused on this strategy and researchers at UVM are encouraged by this innovative approach. Those are a couple of pockets I just wanted to highlight with you, Senator. Um, we do have some directors on the line. A couple of them would like to uh, be first because they got some other appointments. And if it's okay, I'd like to introduce them. Sure. Uh, sure. Sounds like, sounds like your plate is uh, pretty full. Yeah, um, it's, it's full, but it's all, it's, uh, we're looking to the future and I think we have some real opportunities uh, to look beyond this pandemic to maybe solve some of those problems that we've been trying to solve over the last uh, few years. So we're going to treat it as a, we're going to treat it as an opportunity here. Yeah. You know, um, yep. I want to turn it over to uh, Carrie. I know Carrie has to get to another appointment, but Carrie's with our farm division. Uh, Carrie, why don't you introduce yourself yeah. and just give us a little snapshot of what you're, uh, what you're up to. Very good. Uh, good morning, senators. Welcome back to Montpelier. I see you've got a room full here today. I don't know how we all fit in, in Senate Ag. Well, that's but, one uh, advantage of doing it virtually. We all fit in the same room. <laughs> yep, no, we would be virtually impossible without it. Um, Carrie Jaguer, the Director of the Public Health Ag Resource Management Division. Um, most of you are familiar with the programs that I touch, and Senator Perrin, if you would like 
um, to go over them off offline we can and I can give you a deeper dive but the farm division houses the pesticide feed seed fertilizer uh, hemp apiary nursery entomology we do seed potatoes uh, the phytosanitary certificates so Christmas trees and other other uh, Vermont live plants or plants that need to be inspected um, can leave the state or country depending on what they need. Um, we do worker protection training. So basically the folks that work on farms where they use pesticides need to be trained. Um, there's ginseng, there's the vector surveillance program that looks for mosquitoes and ticks in partnership with the health department. Also uh, the pesticide monitoring program, it's an environmental surveillance program um, that's checking the surface and groundwater around the state for pesticide contamination. Um, and we also manage uh, ag hazardous waste as well. Um, one of the other topics that uh, we were in your committee last year to talk about was the Pesticides Advisory Council. Um, the legislation that uh, my division was in to talk with you last year was, um, was the Pesticide Advisory Council, Chlorpyrifos, Atrazine, Glyphosate, and the uh, Ag Residuals Management or Chicken and Compost Bill. So if any of those are likely to come back, we'll be happy to chat with you when, uh, when that time comes. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Thank are there you. any are there any questions from the committee members of Carrie, or would you wait until the end? Yeah, go ahead, answer. All right, um, Laura DiPietro from our Water Quality Division, our director, is with us. And Laura, want to just give a little uh, high level outline of what uh, what's happening in water quality. So, Laura. Yeah. Good morning. Everyone, hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, yeah. So as a reminder, and I know we've met with Senator Corey Parent and other committees, but as a reminder in water quality, I'm the director of the division and Ryan Patch is here on the call and he's the deputy director. And so you'll generally see the two of us, but there's certainly a body of people behind us doing a, a great deal of engine work. Um, and so our focus in the division is focused on non-point source pollution. DEC at the Agency of Natural Resources regulates point source pollution at the, age, or at the state level. So um, in agriculture, that's sort of an interesting space and we have an MOU between us and them. And you'll see some reports in the coming weeks to outline sort of our enforcement, their enforcement and how we operate together. So that's certainly a space we can talk in the future a little bit more about. And um, certainly it's gone a lot smoother. There's a lot more cases in the last um, year since we've last seen each other. I guess we saw each other in the interim, but um, more cases have been referred to A&R and also to the Attorney General's office. So there is um, a body of work there, which really results from the fact that over the last couple of years, we've had a lot more inspectors at the Agency of Agriculture. So there's a lot more boots on the ground. And I will say that um, although the level of enforcement is up for certain, um, our focus in the agency has not changed. Our goal is compliance and our efforts we always start with, and it's in statute, to describe that our first goal is to notify a farmer what their problem is and give them a chance to fix it. And so we continue to operate in that space. And then when they do not make that next step, then it, it elevates from there. But our focus is um, not to try and, and fill our coffers, but to rather get the money on the ground into the project and focus there. So I think we've done a really, really good job of doing that, but certainly the volume is up. Um, <laughs> You will see this year, we're gonna come through and do two rule revisions that are gonna happen likely while you're in session. Uh, one of them will be the RAPs. And that is because a couple of years ago, I think it's been two years now at this point, uh, you gave the authority to us to regulate those people who write nutrient management plans. And so we worked through that process and, and um, we're ready to put that through and, and put that into place. We will have some, some other details within the RAPs uh, nothing that hasn't already, no, nothing too extreme. We're not looking to overhaul the RAPs, um, but rather clarify how we operate within them because some of the challenges we've, we've lived with since the last revision. So we'll give you a rundown on that as well. Happy to do that. 
At the same time, because we talked to the same constituents, we're also going to do the BMP rule. So you all probably remember there's the BMP program that helps farms with capital improvements on, you know, it's the traditional, if you need a barnyard improvement or something to that effect, that program has been in place for over 20 years. But it actually has rules, and they haven't been revised since 1996. They still say department on them, Department of Agriculture, for instance. Uh, so we're going to revise those. Uh, that was something we were audited a couple of years ago now, and that was a flag that the auditor had said that the rules needed to be revised to update <clears throat> and in line with statute because we have been given priorities, for instance, of like what watershed areas we need to make sure funding goes and things like that. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, and then currently we're in the process of hiring five positions. So it's been, we had some, some losses and some movement within our, our division. And so we're in the process of hiring three new inspectors and an engineer for the Middlebury area. And then we just hired someone in the Montpelier group, which um, helped write that $7 million grant that Anson was describing as a pay for phosphorus performance. So we're really grateful to have Sonia Hallett join our team. Um, in the Montpelier office. So definitely a lot there. And then in this last year, granted our budget isn't this big, but you know, sometimes projects come through that were already contracted from a year or two prior. Um, our staff put out and dealt with $9.4 million last year in all the various conservation programs that we have with farmers. Um, so there's a small number of people that work in Montpelier and they are quite the engine uh, to be able to move a significant amount of resources and then the engineering staff is, is really cranking. We've got finally got a good um, consistent staff on deck that is able to do some of these major construction projects on farms. And what we saw in COVID is that it did not derail the construction and design interest from farmers to these projects. So people have been going and, and it's been great. Um, and as you can imagine, the people who do the contract work were very eager to get going once the release of work was opened up. So things kept moving. Um, so we'll see what the next year leads us, because obviously there's been that w most of those projects were well into the pipeline when COVID hit. And so now we've gotten a year later into COVID. And so we'll, we'll have a better understanding of if the longer term impacts are starting to build up. But so far, so good and nothing has slowed down. Um, the last thing I'll just say for, for you, a discussion I, I want to engage in with this year is we are getting a lot more federal money and a great example is a $7 million grant. And the way that federal grants are starting to operate is they're trying to put more of the work on the states, which is, is absolutely fine, but it also puts on us that responsibility to protect that farmer data. And so with the data that as a state and a public entity, we want to be able to share, and then the data that we're collecting under grants such as this, these privacy and, and records requests lines where we have a liability to be able to manage this data because we cannot release it um, becomes more challenging. And so, uh, you know, a conversation about that is one of the things you'll see is a, a report that is gonna come out, the Clean Water Investment Report. All the agriculture is just, it's rocking it out of the park as far as agricultural phosphorus reductions. And all that body of data and the ability to report that to you is because we're able to pull it from all the different partners that work with farmers. And so we built a database that captures all of this. It's the first in the country that's ever done this, where it captures multiple agency databases information. But when it comes to records requests, whose information is it and what is the responsibility? So I think a conversation so that we understand what our rights and responsibilities are is really important. So hope to have that conversation with you into the future. So that's all, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Laura. <laughs> um, one question I was wondering about uh, how how have our agricultural people been doing in regards to compliance with our water quality rules and regs? Are they, are they doing pretty well or fair or poor? How's that all going? I think there's different buckets you could probably put everybody in, right? Those that we have come across that hadn't done anything historically, and so the lift is pretty big. Um, those tend to be the smaller size farms. And then the medium farms, I would say they're sort of broken into two categories, those that didn't really engage as much and those that have more focused on growth in the sense that they've got more newer infrastructure and have engaged with the programs through that process. And the large farms, for the most part, you know, they're all engaged. They have been for years. But I will say when it comes to compliance and across the board, 
Um, what you will see, because of the volume of inspection that we do, we do have to inspect large farms more and medium farms more, uh, the volume of enforcement does tend to reside into the larger farms just because we're there more. Um, small farms certainly have some issues and are, are certainly starting to tip up because we are gathering more and more inspections on them. But I guess what I would just say overall in general is farms are responsive to the process. And I think that the piece is putting them together and having the Clean Water Fund and the ability to help partners, help farmers navigate all of these systems has been yeah. really, really important. So I think things are, are, are good. I would not say that there are challenges, right? There's always a stick in the mud that has to have a little bit more of a nudge to get through the process. But for the most part, farmers want to do the right thing and they've done a lot of great stuff. And what about, I, I assume from your, what you said, that you're talking about dairy. What about the non-dairy farms, you know, like sheep and goats and even vegetable farms, they could have runoffs. Are, are they being assisted and, and helped uh, along the way? So those are typically the smaller size farms, right? Either certified yeah. small farm or smaller. A lot of them tend to be underneath even the certified small farm. So we don't have to routinely inspect those folks, but we do get complaints about them. And so yeah. when we go out and do the complaints, we we offer the same services we would offer any size farm. So um, I will say it is not the majority of our work, right? Dairy is definitely the focus for the most part, just based on the statutory charges we have. Um, but certainly we are there, we're able to regulate them if they need, which is really a, a, at that size, it tends to be an education outreach and see if we can get to compliance. And typically those work out. The, the tougher spaces are still sort of the backyard like operations that um, just don't see themselves in the same vein of agricultural farming as others. Yeah. Are there other questions uh, from the committee? If not, uh, thanks a lot, Laura, and look forward to working with you as we move forward. Thank you, me too. Maybe if we could, maybe Senator could turn to Ryan Patch. Is Ryan on? He's our Deputy Director of Water Quality and uh, he might give us just an overview of our, our new program on uh, our performance program. Ryan, you there? Yep, I am. All right. <clears throat> this is all right with you, uh, uh, Chair Starr. I'll, I'll just share a brief update on uh, Vermont Pay for Phosphorus program. Um, so yeah, um, last year I uh, came before the committee to share an update on the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group. Uh, last year, uh, legislature was able to reauthorize uh, that group, uh, changing uh, the name to focus more on ecosystem services and soil health and adding an additional year to uh, complete this work. Um, you know, this, this process was a farmer driven effort to look at agriculture as more than just the, you know, provision of uh, food and fiber, right? When you manage agricultural cropland well, you can derive a lot of different benefits uh, that can affect climate change in positive ways through both mitigation, uh, adaptation, and resilience for both agricultural systems as well as, you know, downstream landowners uh, when you have a, a well-functioning floodplain as, as an example. Um, and so this holistic scope of work uh, is something that was uh, derailed by uh, COVID-19 and, and, and the pandemic, um, but there was a lot of independent work uh, that was ongoing, uh, both uh, from the Agency of Agriculture, which I'm gonna share a brief update on, but also as Secretary Tebbett shared, um, other organizations have been engaged in uh, getting national research grants to further explore the intersections between soil health, water quality, and the opportunities for a whole host of, of ecosystem service benefits. Um, and so there's, there's updates to be shared in, in that space um, as well. And then the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group is being reconvened um, in February to continue the work of the organization uh, or, or the working group um, and to further dig into some of these questions. Uh, one of the updates that the agency will be sharing both with the working group and then also to share uh, here with the committee as well is the new 
uh, $7 million uh, NRCS uh, USDA uh, grant, uh, the $7 million award, which is a pay for performance uh, grant. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, opportunity and it provides uh, an opportunity to augment existing uh, programming that um, Laura shared with regards to some of the, you know, BMP and other agronomic uh, practices, practice payment programs that the agency has. Um, it, you folks will be reminded of uh, most of the financial assistance programs focus on paying for practice. You implement an acre of cover crop, there's a, a financial assistance rate that covers a portion of the cost of implementing that practice. Um, and we, as Laura shared, um, the report will be out on Friday, the 15th of January, the Clean Water Investment Report. And there'll be a lot of great details there about how these programs are successful and cost effective. Um, this pay for performance grant is an opportunity to, as I said, hopefully augment that. And, um, you know, lots of details to, to share in there. Uh, but essentially, the goal is to take a look at a, a whole farm uh, and take a look at their management. And through modeling software, the software is called Farm Prep, uh, compare the farm's current management to the historic base management as represented in the TMDL for phosphorus in the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, and once a farm makes phosphorus reductions past the threshold, um, they'll be eligible for a payment on a per pound of phosphorus basis. Um, we've learned through the working group, the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group, that some of the programs the agency has offered in the past, um, there's barriers to a farm participating in it. It's a lot of time and effort to even become eligible in some cases. And so uh, an incentive payment for a farmer just applying for the program, running their farm through the program and, and understanding where they fall on the spectrum of whether they're exceeding the threshold or they still need to do some work, uh, will have an incentive payment tied to it regardless of the farm's performance. And then a farm can learn what they may need to do to become eligible for a payment uh, through this program. Um, you know, $7 million grant, at least $4.9 million of that will be payments to farmers for pounds of phosphorus reduced. Um, and this will help, you know, leverage and augment uh, the, the already, you know, strong uh, efforts farms have been making in making phosphorus reductions, uh, which will be reflected in the Clean Water Investment Report. So very exciting model. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, nationally uh, from other states. Uh, Maryland and Ohio have reached out trying to learn more about um, you know, what we're doing and, and how, what structure uh, we're using to put this in place. Um, and so we're you know, very excited to be working to implement this. Uh, we also have a re another research grant from the state uh, NRCS Vermont uh, to uh, do research on specifically, you know, farm prep and um, the, the pay for phosphorus concept this first year uh, in 2021. So lo lots of exciting work happening there and, and happy to share and continue the conversation around payment for ecosystem services. And, and it should be said that <laughs> this, this pay for phosphorus grant is, is much more narrow than the scope of the working group. And so in no way fully answers uh, the, the goal or structure that the working group was looking for. So still lots of discussions there, especially around um, climate change and opportunities for agricultural uh, mitigation of uh, uh, CO2 emissions from, from agriculture. So very exciting body of work and, and, and happy to share uh, further details uh, if, if the committee is interested. So thanks very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, Ryan, um, the ecosystems the whole thing, ag, forestry, uh, you know, all of our open spaces and, and rural spaces. Um, I know I, I wanna get into that quite a little bit this year, uh, if we can to improve all this. Uh, how, how well would you say, are people accepting uh, this plan pretty well, or have you gotten to that point yet? to where people can sign up or volunteer or however you do it? Um, yeah, there, there, we've had a lot of interest from local farmers uh, in this. We've held uh, some outreach meetings and are doing our outreach through AgReview and, and other uh, avenues. Uh, this concept, I, I think, is one that when you share it with those that are non-farmers as well, there's understanding of 
you know, a, a transaction, a payment for a particular outcome as being a potential efficient way and cost effective way to derive and get uh, some some enhanced public goods. Um, and, and so, yes, it, it seems like a, maybe for some a, a complicated program, but we're very hopeful that the, you know, we're, we're just going to be working with uh, 10 to 12 farms in 2021 uh, 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 hopefully a diverse snapshot of small through large farms uh, for, for every part of the state. This is going to be a statewide program. So while we are paying for performance and paying for phosphorus, it'll be phosphorus reductions in any watershed. Uh, and so making sure that, um, you know, we, we have outreach statewide is, is one of our goals uh, right now. Uh, it should be said that the grant award was uh, announced in November of 2020, and we're still uh, working with USDA to get uh, the grant signed. And so, um, you know, the, the, the funding is not exactly in hand right now, but we are out ahead to do that outreach, uh, for which I, I've had a good response and, and significant interest from farms of, of many different um, sizes and, and sectors, different types of, of farming. <clears throat> um, it should be said the eligibility is focused on uh, cropland and hayland. Yeah, is that is this something like John Roberts and that group he's working with are are pushing forward on so that, that I know there's some larger farms a mixture of all types in in that group. Yes, um, the um, Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition, Farmers Water Watershed Alliance, the Connecticut River Farmers Watershed Alliance, we're absolutely engaging. Uh, with those. Um, I'll let them speak whether this program, uh, you know, meets the mark for them, um, but we've definitely been engaging and, and they're going to be key collaborators. Um, there's going to be a, uh, what are we calling it, uh, advisory group um, pulling in uh, the farmers to make sure that the program is developed and, and um, it works for those that will be participating in it. Um, again, you know, in the ecosystem services space, um, the, the vision and the services that a lot of those farmers were interested in being recognized for is broader than just phosphorus. And so this program doesn't get at soil carbon. It doesn't get at functioning floodplains. Um, it doesn't get at, um, you know, organic matter um, improvements in the soil as an example. And it isn't focusing on the, you know, associated forest lands that farms manage as well. So there's a lot of opportunity to continue to expand the, the, the scope, um, but for the purposes of trying to stand up a structure for quantifying reductions and having payments, we, we chose to focus narrowly on uh, phosphorus for the agency's grant uh, and the Vermont Pay for Performance system. But there's lots of opportunities to quantify other ecosystem service benefits from farms. Um, th this is just one where the mechanisms were in place to attempt to quantify and, and compensate farmers um, for phosphorus. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Are there any, Anthony? Ryan, I just wanted this, you said a lot there and I appreciate it. I just wanted to get it clear. I mean, $7 million grant we're talking about, right? For pay for, for, for performance. Did you say that 4 million of it would go to f farmers particularly? Uh, 4.9 million uh, for direct uh, in payments for phosphorus reductions to farms. So where, where would the rest of the money go? The balance is going for IT development. There is a modeling tool and database, which is essential for the efficient uh, calculations of base loads, as well as um, predicted reductions. Um, there is uh, field verification uh, for contractors that are going to be needed to uh, validate that what's entered in the, in the program is um, indeed what's happening on the ground. And then technical assistance for both uh, input and, um, you know, another contract for those organizations that will be supporting farms to uh, navigate and move through the program uh, and, uh, you know, troubleshoot input and in, inputting information into the database and then also um, providing recommendations on how to potentially meet the standards to uh, increase stewardship levels and then um, a great administration um, for the agency as well. And uh, USDA NRCS also takes a portion of that for their administrative um, uh, requirements uh, within the program. And is this the same one where you said that there would be about 12 farmers participating? So that's a separate scope of work. We are hoping to get over 100 farms uh, by the end of the five-year uh, grant program. This first year in 2021, uh, we have 
say, 12 farms as our target for this first year um, to um, complete the, the research phase of the implementation of this program. So starting uh, small with a conservation innovation grant from USDA Vermont, NRCS Vermont, uh, and then expansion to 50 farms is the goal for uh, 2022. Signups would be in the late fall of uh, calendar year 21. And I know sometimes farmers talk to me about the difficulty in applying for these kinds of programs, you know, and you mentioned that they're just, it's a, it's a complicated process and whatnot. So I presume we're doing everything we can to help farmers through the application process, the grant process. That's correct. It, yes, Senator, that's part of what the additional balance of funding goes to is to provide technical assistance providers uh, to support the app, their, uh, getting their information into the program and also for which the incentive payment is a, an encouragement. Uh, once a farm's data is entered into the program, there's a per acre payment up to a $4,000 cap, uh, recognizing the time it takes for them to navigate potentially the system. And so that's what that um, uh, uh, data entry payment uh, uh, incentive is, is attempting to address is uh, the obstacle to applying and how complicated the program can be. So both providing TA uh, through the program and then also an incentive to the farmer to apply uh, because they could do all this work and not be eligible. Uh, but hopefully if they're not eligible, they can work on a plan to uh, improve their management so that they can receive uh, payment uh, for phosphorus in the next year uh, of, the, of the program. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Chris. Just quickly, Ryan. Just quickly, Ryan. With the the grant that informs the tools and the measurements and stuff, can we assume that a lot of that is something we would be able to use in an ongoing fashion uh, beyond the life of this grant? Yes. So uh, long farm prep is an existing um, uh, tool that, that is available uh, for folks to check out uh, today. Uh, and uh, after the, this pay for phosphorus grant, you know, if the program is successful, we'd be hope to be able to continue it um, past the five-year grant. Uh, any other questions from the committee for Ryan? If not, uh, who's our next presenter? Uh, Deputy Eastman, if Deputy Eastman wants to say hi, uh, Deputy Eastman uh, has been with us for four years and she will be probably one of your key contacts uh, throughout the legislative session, a former lawmaker from the House. Uh, but if you just want to say hi, Allison, um, it's Good all yours. Morning. Good morning, all, and um, welcome back. Happy to see everybody and uh, congratulations on your uh, reelection. Uh, we look forward to working with you. And I have to say, uh, listening to Ryan about the payment for ecosystem services, every one of the directors that you hear from, there's so much exciting work going on. And I'm um, just proud of the amount of money that um, our team was able to um, get out for CRF funds. We couldn't have done it without our technical service providers in the field. Um, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our partnerships with VITA, um, also VHCB, Farm Viability, UVM Extension. And uh, I look at the partnership that we had uh, with our legislators in crafting that legislation. It was a pretty impressive uh, to move out just short of $26 million. So excited to continue the, the great work and uh, thank you for all you do. Welcome back and um, please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything we can assist you with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, good to see you again. <laughs> um, who's up next? Um, well, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, we're talking about the CARES dollars and uh, uh, the key components of getting that money out the door was the Agriculture Development Division. So I wanna turn it over to uh, Abby Willard uh, at some point, Abby would probably like to come back to you and, and do a real deep dive on uh, on that experience and uh, what worked and maybe with some of the gaps, but I'm gonna turn it over to Abby Willard, uh, Director of the Agriculture Development Division, Abby. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Abby. Good morning. How are you doing, Senator? Good. Good. Well, it's nice to meet everyone. Senator Parent, um, we haven't met before, so nice to meet you. Welcome to the Senate Ag Committee. Thanks, nice to meet you too. And, and other senators, nice to have you back. Um, 
I'm happy to talk a little bit about VCAP and, but I, maybe I'll start with just giving a little bit of background about the Ag Development Division. So I'm Abby Willard, Director of the Ag Development Division at the agency. Um, we primarily work on market development, business viability, and provide financial support and business technical assistance to a variety of ag businesses and food and working lands businesses. We are a non-regulatory division, as I think most, if not all of you realize, but we play a really important role in support to our regulatory division. So whether that's helping with marketing or messaging to the industry or uh, connecting with partners. So our role is really focused on promoting Vermont agriculture and our food and ag businesses to kind of Vermonters, but also as far reaching as international markets and consumers. So we're always leading some sort of um, international trade mission to various countries and places to try to spread the word and popularity of Vermont products. We connect Vermont businesses to different markets. So that may be in-state markets, but oftentimes it's really looking at regional and national and even at times international market opportunities for our ag and food businesses. We are playing a role at times in what we call increasing agricultural literacy. So just building a conversation and a comfort around speaking about agriculture and the benefits that that has to our economy and to our communities and to each of us as Vermonters. And so there's a variety of education that happens there through our various programs that we lead or just different partnerships that we engage in. And then lastly, really exploring um, opportunities for um, elevating an individual sector or moving a particular issue or opportunity forward. So oftentimes those can be the conversations that we have in your virtual or uh, in-person committee room is talking about how do we help this sector or how do we change or move or advance this particular initiative. So we're a small division, we're 15 staff. Um, so we are responsible for a variety of different programs. Um, and our work most recently has been spent in a couple of ways that I thought I would share. So um, we spent a lot of time on VCAP. Uh, there were 33 staff at the Agency of Agriculture, so not all within the Ag Development Division um, that was, I would say, primarily led by efforts of Diane Bothfeld and myself over the past 10 months. Um, so 33 staff from within our agency, many of the folks um, at the director and section chief level, so many on this call were instrumental in those 6,500 um, consumer, I mean, excuse me, customer service interactions, and that's $26 million that went out the door. Um, so again, we had five different programs. So there was the dairy program, there was the um, ag and working lands, there was funding for farmers markets, funding for farm to school, and then for agricultural fairs. So um, we can share some more data on that. And if you have questions about that, I think Diane and I and others um, are working on pulling together both an impact report as well as some data um, analysis from the Salesforce platform where all the applications came in. Um, <coughs> I will also say there's a variety of um, industry trend data that we also have that I could give a few highlights on, which I think is really interesting and something that we probably could do a longer conversation around. Um, but the key highlights being from surveys that we led and have partnered on, um, 44% of businesses experienced some sort of loss due to the pandemic in sales. Um, two thirds of the ag businesses that again, that responded to surveys demonstrated that they had business and market channel changes as a result of the pandemic. Of those businesses that didn't change um, their markets or had more difficulty in making a pivot during the pandemic alluded to four different things that they lacked. One being um, the skills to do something different or to uh, pivot their business, the lack of infrastructure to be able to reach a new customer or engage in their production in a different way, um, the lack of labor uh, to make an addition to their business model or a shift in their business, and uh, the financial assistance. So 
um, to, to change their business model. So acknowledging that $26 million um, that we were able to contribute as well as the various other uh, CRF funds that came through Agency of Commerce or Forest Parks and Recreation, as well as other federal programs that kind of collectively worked to meet the need of our ag community were incredibly um, valuable um, to kind of see agriculture continue to move forward over the past 10 months. Um, another kind of simultaneous effort that we've been engaged in over the same period of time, which has been slightly um, appropriately timed, I believe, has been uh, the finalization of the new 10-year Ag and Food System Strategic Plan. So uh, initiated by the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, but done in partnership with our agency over the past year. And you'll have an opportunity on February 11th uh, to get a um, review and a joint testimony on that plan. That plan is an impressive piece of work, and it now includes a a vision for the next 10 years for agriculture, a sense of what the priority goals as well as recommendations for moving agriculture forward in the state, and then specifically looking at individual sectors, market channels, and underlying issues impacting agriculture and kind of the current condition and where we, um, where the industry and those that contributed to the, to the plan yeah. see opportunities for moving forward. So lots of discussion, I think, around that plan in our future and really look to that as a, a vision and a plan for the future of agriculture in Vermont. Um, Secretary Tabitz mentioned uh, the Dairy Business Innovation Center. There was just a press release that um, kind of announced that effort this week. Um, every other week through the next couple of months, there will be a new funding opportunity or some RFP released out of that center that will have um, market or innovation or industry support for the dairy community. Again, it will not just be focused in Vermont, so it's designed to be for the Northeast, but having the hub here at the Agency of Agriculture in Vermont is um, a significant benefit to our dairy economy and our dairy producers. So it'll be really exciting to see these various um, efforts that get announced every other week for the next couple of months. I'm really excited to have that staff, uh, that, that center fully staffed and activities underway. Um, the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is something that you're very familiar with and we do every year. Um, you also will have an opportunity to um, get the impact report and conversation around that initiative on January 27th. So there's an event that um, has already been scheduled to talk about the working lands investments over the past year. Um, so that continues to be one of our largest annual and general fund appropriated um, funding opportunities or grant programs as we call them um, to support ag, food and working lands businesses. So collectively on average year, the working, or excuse me, the um, ag development division puts out about $3 million in grants um, in a variety of funding opportunities to our ag community and working lands being the, the largest um, generally. Um, and then that's in addition to other federal resources that we bring in to do more of our marketing work and um, individual sector assistance. So we have uh, federal funds that supports the maple industry. And then we often have some sort of um, dairy promotion and marketing assistance work for various sectors. Um, the marketing work is something that has become really apparent as a priority during this pandemic. So really supporting businesses to make some shifts and looking at e-commerce and digital marketing opportunities, knowing that two thirds of businesses had to make some sort of market shift um, in the past 10 months is pretty significant. And we um, have, ask some great survey questions and have some interesting results about based on the market channels that businesses are now supporting if they think that they would go back to uh, their old markets and the um, input and feedback from businesses is that they don't anticipate that. They expect to be able to continue to move forward in the markets that they're serving, which means e-commerce, digital marketing and direct to consumer marketing have an incredible opportunity for future uh, growth and sustained um, kind of market uh, influence, I guess. 
so thinking about how we support virtual events and engage businesses and understanding digital marketing opportunities continues to be something that we focus on and direct a lot of our attention and services to. Um, you're aware of our produce program as well as our farm to school program. Both of those have had some interesting adjustments as everyone can talk to as a result of, the, of COVID. Um, but we continue to serve those industries both on an educational side as well as a regulatory side for the produce community and uh, really focus on the agricultural literacy component and procurement of local food for our farm to school. So happy to talk about any of those programs that we primarily run um, at another time. Quick last comment I'll make is just like, so what are we focused on currently? I would say we're focused on the launch of this new ag and food system strategic plan and the messaging around that and then the implications of having a new future of ag plan for the next 10 years, so through 2030. Um, as Secretary Tebbets mentioned, Diane and I and a team are really working on looking at both an impact report and some data analysis on our VCAP investments. So we will hopefully do some kind of parallel comparison to some of the other federal funds yeah. that came through to agriculture, whether that's the PPP program or CFAP or a few others. But generally, we can speak to how our $25.6 million benefited and impacted businesses. So hopefully by the first week in February, we'll have all that data to be able to share um, and happy to come back. Uh, continuing to work on different slaughter um, infrastructure and industry expansion opportunities. So the Food Safety Consumer Protection Division and uh, Dr. McNamara and Julie Bovere can talk about that in greater detail um, as they work on that every day, but really looking at that sector as a kind of ongoing uh, pinch point in the food system, as well as the dairy innovation side. So dairy was hit really hard, particularly our cheese makers and cheese industry, which um, again, Dr. Haas or E.B. Flory can speak more to as they work with that population on a daily basis. Um, but those are examples of ways that we're connecting with our regulatory programs and doing a variety of different partnership projects and marketing efforts. Um, I, think, I think that's it. I think there's lots of great data to share about what we're learning about the ag community as a result of kind of surviving through this pandemic. Yeah. Well, thank you, Abby. Um, I know, uh, I think all the committee has been uh, invited to the uh, uh, press conference on the strategic plan on uh, February 8th. And so hopefully, uh, I think that's on a Monday, but I hope uh, some of us can attend and, and uh, we'll be talking a lot more about that. Uh, one of the issues that the President Pro Tem has, has laid out for us in Ag is to uh, work a lot on like food security, making sure that, uh, you know, we've got people properly trained in, in our lands uh, so that we can uh, guarantee uh, some food for our our citizens and and I, you know, we'll talk about the slaughter stuff in a little bit, probably uh, more with Dr. Haas. Uh, but um, one of the issues that that came up, well, and it's it's probably in front of you guys right now at the ag agency is people can't get their animals in to get slaughtered and 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 packaged and and taken care of. And some of them I've heard as late as 22. Now, if, if you want to get an appointment, it's got to be in the year of 22. And so, um, you know, I think the committee will, will be taking a hard uh, look at how we can help our slaughter facilities to update and, and improve the output uh, for food security. Um, you didn't mention, I don't think you did much about the farmer markets um, and uh, how well how well did they do with their limited uh, space and spacing out and all that? Can you just give us a 
quick overview of how that all went? Yeah, so th let me just say broadly, um, I believe one of the great benefits if we were to find the silver lining of COVID-19 was the ability for Vermont's ag community to feed Vermonters. Yeah. And we saw an unbelievable support for interest in and commitment to ensuring that neighbors and community members were fed during this pandemic, kind of both response and ongoing recovery efforts. And the number of volunteers and donations and kind of good good citizen, kind of common good benefit that, that Vermonters gave to one another was incredible. And the agricultural community continued to sort of step up and be a source of food and resources and security for, for our state. And I, I'm so grateful for all those businesses, even those that demonstrated incredible economic loss and loss of revenue that still made an effort to support um, Vermonters was, was pretty special. Um, one of the impact reports that we'll share is specifically on uh, farmers markets. So based upon the, the resources that they received and the losses that they claimed and sort of what impact that had on the industry. But we definitely saw, and I don't have in front of me the data, um, though I can, though I'll, I'll look it up, um, the increase in sales that farmers markets experienced even with fewer vendors and in certain circumstances, fewer weeks that they were available to, to vend. Um, the amount of interest in direct to consumer relationships, so either customers going to the farm or going, uh, participating in a CSA or attending a farmer's market was incredible. I think we, we heard that CSA participation increased by 200%. And so farms were sold out and um, at, operating at capacity early on in the, in the pandemic. So the timing for that was, was interesting and I think helpful in some regards. Um, but I think farmers markets were one of those examples of an industry that wasn't deemed essential and they were really frustrated by that. They wanted to be yeah. considered a grocery store, but they continued to provide food and they were really accommodating of the COVID and public health limitations. They, they maintained the 12 foot distancing, they wore masks and had sanitizers and put out extra tables to be able to ensure safe um, commerce in those outdoor markets. And as a result, consumers continued to come to markets and develop relationships with those farmers, either to be picked up at the farm or uh, curbside pickup at markets. So I think they were incredibly resilient and um, committed to continuing to serve people. The Montpelier Farmers Market is still meeting outdoors. Thank you. Yeah, and many markets and numerous markets have made that commitment Good. to still do outdoor markets. Right. Yeah. Any other questions from committee members? Thank you, Abby uh, Anson. Yes, um, one of our. Uh, one of our support systems is the lab in Randolph uh, Vale, and they support every division uh, in the agency. Um, also, they support uh, everything from water quality to dairy to entomology, uh, and they have a partnership with the DEC as well. So I want to introduce uh, Dr. Rebecca Harvey. Uh, she gave us a little overview of uh, what's happening at the lab. The lab has uh, you know, stayed open in person um, all the agency workers have been there throughout the pandemic and it's on the campus of ETC. So if uh, Rebecca's available, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca. Sure, yeah, thanks Anson. And thanks for the invite to join you all today. Um, it's my first time meeting many of you, if not all of you. Um, as Anson said, I'm the director of the Vermont Agriculture and Environmental Laboratory down here in Randolph Center. Um, and I think it, it's, it's appropriate to say that we really provide a lot of um, support for all of the other programs that you've heard about so far today. So um, we run the gamut of agricultural tests and environmental tests here. Um, we provide testing to support the milk and dairy industry here in, in Vermont um, to make sure products are of high quality and are safe. We provide testing to support the animal health industry, which you'll hear more about with Dr. Haas. Um, we also provide guarantee analyses to um, the farm division, so all of their feed, seed, fertilizer testing, pesticide analysis, 
Uh, we support the meat industry in providing testing to ensure that meat is of high quality. Um, and we also support the agency's industrial hemp testing program. Um, in addition to that, we provide environmental testing, mostly for the Department of Environmental Conservation. So anything related to phosphorus, many of those samples, if not all of them, are coming through our laboratory. Um, we also provide air quality testing to support EPA programs that are run through DEC. Um, and new to this year, we're also providing bacteria testing for private and public wells. So um, drinking water testing as well. Um, so really our, our role here is to support the agency and the Agency of Natural Resources in their monitoring efforts. And how are you, how, how many people do you have at the lab? Yeah, so we actually have 14 analysts here in the biology and chemistry labs. Um, we've been here full time throughout the pandemic. We actually, we do have two vacancies right now that we're working to fill, but in the whole facility, we also have laboratories that are staffed by um, the Weights and Measures Lab, which um, Kristen Haas directs. Um, also the, the DEC has a couple of laboratory spaces here. So um, a lot of the other laboratories, much of their work is considered field-based. So on a, on a, you know, during peace times when, when there is no pandemic, there might be upwards of 20 to 30 people here on any given day. Um, but in terms of uh, analysts, highly skilled trained analysts who are working for our agency and our laboratory, um, we have a full-time staff of 14 plus two seasonal temps that we generally hire in um, that allow us to process tens of thousands of environmental samples each summer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that must have made quite a boom. Randolph Center's employment uh, with having a lab there and the college, is, does the college do some, some work with you folks? Do the students ever get to get any training within the lab or any of that? Yeah, we certainly had um, a significant amount of turnover when we relocated down here. Um, and one reason why I was excited to take on the role as director is, is because I have a connection with academia. I came from the field of academia before coming to the state. And I'm really excited to see kind of how those partnerships flesh out with us and VTC. Unfortunately, um, be because it's only been about two years since we've been here, half of which we've been plagued with this pandemic, yeah. we haven't had many opportunities. We have a great working uh, relationship with VTC, with their biology chair, their science chair. Um, we have hired seasonal temps from VTC, which has been fantastic. I really hope that one of them who we've worked with in the past applies to one of our vacancies because she was, she was great. Um, so it's kind of yet to be seen. Um, Dr. Haas might speak more to the animal pathology lab that we have here in the facility, but VTC has a animal vet program, a vet tech program, and we're hoping that we might be able to establish some sort of partnership where they might be able to use our pathology lab for some of their necropsy experiments. So a lot of ideas kind of floating around, but we haven't had the opportunity to really yep. certify anything at this point. Yeah. Well, more time will probably uh, work better for the results, yes. Uh, any questions from the committee members? If not, uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, Anson. Uh, sure, we've got um, um, Dr. Haas who's with us. You, you know Dr. Haas in charge of our uh, consumer division, also our state veterinarian, and um, she can give us a little update on some of the things that are happening in, in her world. Dr. Haas? Yeah. Sure, thank you, Anson. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, I have a couple of slides I would love to share with you. And um, while I'm doing that here, uh, I also just want to uh, take the opportunity. Um, we had Dr. Kathy McNamara on the line. She had to jump off for a, a conflicting appointment and, um, but still uh, on the line with us is our meat inspection program. 
uh, section chief, uh, Julie Bovere. And so if there are questions that come up about meat inspection that require a slightly more deep dive than what I'm able to do, then uh, Julie Julie can cover. And I think you'll be, I know you'll be hearing from EB2 about uh, with a little bit deeper dive into, into dairy. Um, but in the meantime, let me just try one more time here. And if my screen share plan doesn't work, then I'm just gonna wing it without. Let's see, does that show up for you folks? Um, slide on the screen? Yep, okay, perfect. Yep. Then we're gonna go with that. Uh, just for a, an oversight of the Food Safety and Consumer Protection Division, for most of you, this will be um, a, a rehash or a review. Uh, and for Senator Parent, um, welcome to the committee and look forward to working with you as well as all the members. And this will give you an overview of um, what the Food, Safe, Food Safety and Consumer Protection Division comprises. So um, as Anson said, my name is Kristen Hawes. I'm the director for the division and uh, the state veterinarian for the agency. And the Food Safety and Consumer Protection Division is a 38 person uh, division. So it, it, it is a large one. And we are focused on, in a nutshell, the two buckets that you see here, ensuring safe food. Um, so there was discussion already, I know on food security, that's something that we're very invested in. Uh, so ensuring safe food and also fair markets for you and, and all Vermonters that um, engage in these activities uh, on our soil. So we like to say, if you eat or if you buy stuff in Vermont, then where are your people? We're some of your people. So working behind the scenes to make sure that you can do that efficiently and uh, affordably and safely. I think that um, one thing that is worth noting, one of the things worth noting about our division is that it's a, it's a varied group of employees. Um, it comprises scientists, technical experts, specialists, and generalists. And we are a mature bunch, I will say. Um, many of our employees are uh, eligible for retirement. And so we have a lot of institutional knowledge within the division, but also um, have identified a need uh, in the recent past to engage in some strategic planning. So we recently completed a strategic plan in July, I believe of 2020, um, and are working on implementing that now. Uh, I know that Linda has shared that on your, shared the executive summary of that plan on your website, if you care to uh, look more into that. But just by way of a summary, um, we did reconfigure uh, the Food Safety and Consumer Protection Division a little bit as part of that. And here you can see the, the basically the buckets of um, areas of expertise and, and focuses of work that we, uh, that we prioritize. So food safety is certainly Certainly a big one. Um, you can see the commodities here that we have uh, regulatory authority over. Um, and I would also just point out that we do consider animal health as part of that food safety spectrum. Um, when we look at from farm to farm to fork, uh, animal health in, in a live animal form is important to and informs the subsequent food safety of the products that we eat. So um, we consider that a, a, a part of that spectrum as well. Uh, many of you are familiar with our, our weights and measures team. Uh, Rebecca mentioned the weights and measures laboratory that is in Randolph. That's a very productive laboratory that has continued to maintain uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology certification through the pandemic and before. So we provide services not only to uh, Vermont businesses and individuals, but also to uh, neighboring states businesses. And um, many of them bring their products, their devices and heavy, heavy duty weights and other things over to the lab for calibration and inspection. Our animal health section uh, has undergone little bit of change since we last saw you. Uh, Dr. Shelley Mellenbacher, who was our assistant state veterinarian for the past eight years, uh, moved on into a position with USDA. So we're looking forward to welcoming a new assistant state vet. Um, we're going to call her the other Dr. Levine. Her name is Kate Levine, and she uh, is starting with us actually on Tuesday. Yeah. So um, we'll try and keep her separate from the health commissioner who is in a lot of the headlines these days, but um, looking forward to welcoming Kate and hopefully introducing her to, to all of you. So um, animal health is another important uh, piece that we, that we do here. Abby uh, already spoke to you about the Ag Development Division. Um, and I think one thing that I want to highlight uh, is that we have worked hard to continue to expand um, 
our produce uh, safety efforts and under the, the produce safety rule um, that was implemented as part of the Food Safety Modernization Act about five years ago. So uh, this past year, we just completed our first year of true regulatory inspections uh, and those inspections and the regular regulation and enforcement is, um, is handled through our division, but we work in partnership with the Agricultural Development Division to implement that program within the agency. So that's been an exciting uh, transition that continues to evolve and the program development is, is ongoing. Uh, with this graphic, you can see, again, the, the, the sections and the buckets that we focus on. Um, I think what I would draw your attention to is uh, at the top here, the mix of education and regulation. And I'm proud and I, I think I speak for our whole division and hopefully the agency in saying that I'm very proud of the mix that we're able to, to utilize um, with those two tools that we uh, focus on to help constituents and businesses within Vermont. Um, our division is a regulatory division, but we spend a tremendous amount of time, rightly so, and I think well appropriated uh, in helping startup businesses get off the ground and, and get running and also um, troubleshooting and working with business owners and constituents to make sure that their businesses remain compliant. Uh, and that enables them to one, assure a, a safe and healthy product for all of us, but also um, to access markets uh, outside of the state of state of Vermont. So I'm very proud of that nice mix that we have uh, with our staff and the expertise that we're able to to um, pass on. So you can see uh, the other the other again sections and buckets. Um, one of the restructuring pieces that we did with our division over the past year is we plucked uh, the ag products work out of the, the now weights and measures section and kind of segregated those two things since they are so different. And we now have an ag products section that covers maple uh, and produce and also handles the uh, country of origin labeling audits that uh, go on in retail locations. So I think this graphic really sums up, you know, what our division does as a whole and, um, there's a lot to say in that one picture. The other, uh, I'll end just with, um, at least with this part, with covering some of our, our values. I think these are important in this day and age with everything that we've been through. So these uh, terms that you see on the screen here outline how our team likes to work. And while it was a concerted effort to involve all of our staff in developing these values for our strategic plan, I, I would venture to say that these are, you know, in all likelihood, the values that the agency as a whole um, strives to, to highlight and to use as well. So um, uh, we've had, during COVID, um, we've had the opportunity to uh, really engage in some efforts to also expand businesses and their abilities to, to uh, increase their markets. And I think one of the best examples of that, that I would like to highlight for you all, and Julie um, can perhaps speak more about it, but um, we've had the ability to facilitate market expansion within the meat sector and meat and poultry sector. And so uh, just within the last several months, our meat inspection program has um, has meet the criteria with FSIS, the Food Safety Inspection Service, to uh, take on a new cooperative agreement and a new meat program. Um, and it's the Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program. This allows state inspected uh, product that has been, that has passed through state inspection at our state uh, facilities to be marketed and sold outside of the state of Vermont. And so that's, this is the first time in I would say modern Vermont history that this has been allowed um, to be done. And it's it's to the credit of our meat inspection program uh, that this has been accomplished. So we look forward to bringing on businesses that might uh, find, take interest in um, taking advantage of, of, that, of that program. Uh, that's kind of the overview of our division. A couple of things just to pick up on from the conversation so far. Uh, Rebecca mentioned the pathology lab. I am very excited to work with Rebecca and our new assistant state veterinarian to uh, explore options for use of that lab. Uh, right now it is, it is, I'll acknowledge it's not being utilized to its full potential. So 
And we do need to explore ways to, to get uh, better use out of that space. And that might come from VTC. It could also come from local uh, and statewide veterinarians uh, for lab purposes and, and other things. And then we'll look at ways to internally expand its use as well. Um, you mentioned food security earlier in the conversation. And I would say that one thing that we have seen and, and we've recognized um, the need to focus on within our animal health section is along with uh, more people wanting to raise their own animals for food production to feed their families and perhaps their neighbors. There also has been an increased need to make sure that we maintain traceability of those animals and, and the products that they produce. Um, and the way that we're working toward doing that is trying to make available to producers across the state uh, radio excuse me, electronic ID um, and, and supporting infrastructure um, to better trace uh, their production animals. So we have an allotment of about 4,000 RFID tags, radio frequency ID tags um, that we are giving out for free um, to producers of all sorts with a focus on, on bovine animals. And we'll continue to do that and um, get those materials out to folks and work with them to get them up to speed to transition to that functionality should they choose to, choose to do so. Um, the way in which we hope to interact with you all during this session is a couple of things come to mind. One is we are working on putting together a food safety and consumer protection division newsletter just to get the word out a little bit better about the work that we do. Hope to be able to include you all, if you're willing, as recipients of that newsletter. It'll probably be quarterly to start. And then secondly, we do have um, some proposals in the agency's housekeeping bill this year that we'll look forward to talking further with you um, about. So with that, uh, that's the summary. Happy to answer questions or um, turn it over to Senator Yu or to Anson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, have you received many complaints or concerns in regards to time slots um, at slaughter facilities? We we do hear concerns about that. Yes, that is a that's a valid um, that's a a valid concern. I think um, is Julie. Yeah, Julie is still on. Julie, not to put you on the spot, but I but I will because you're at the receiving end of a lot of those conversations. So, Julie, could you comment on the specifics with that? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Julie Bovier. This is my first time um, with you all, so it's nice to meet you and um, looking forward to a good year. Yeah, so it, there is a problem with um, slaughter slots, um, and it still will become a problem until we can get more people out there who want to open up some slaughter facilities. Um, currently, we are working with two, uh, just two right now, but but getting them on board has been a little hard. Um, one is brand new, starting from scratch, trying to get building supplies, electrician, plumbers. It's it's kind of, you know, set them back a little bit because of COVID, trying just getting all the supplies together. Um, the other one, however, is um, a plant that um, was um, shut down for a while. This is back out in Wilmington, Vermont. Um, so another outfit came over and they actually leased it, then wound up buying it. And so they are able to get it up and running. They're currently under a custom exempt but I just heard from them a couple of weeks ago and they're moving forward to USDA inspection. So we're hoping that's gonna come through pretty quickly. So that'll be an, an, you know, a good facility to, you know, for people down the Southern part of Vermont to have another choice to be able to go. Um, but I think for now, we're gonna continue to hear this until our slaughter facilities get up and running or, or they can get caught up a bit more. And one of the things that we're coming across is, they can keep up with the slaughter, but they can't keep up with the processing. So we've got coolers full of carcasses mm -hmm. and just trying to keep up with that part of it. Um, we're trying to work with other sectors, um, a lot of our um, possible custom exempt facilities, trying to get them on board under inspection. Um, but again, it's timing. It's, it's getting them to be able to sit down and write a HASA plan, a food safety um, plan that we can go and approve. Uh, approving their facility is is can be done fairly quickly because we already have because they're already under custom exempt. So we're just hoping that this this will be a, a another avenue um, for these people, and then it will 
take the pressure more off of the slaughter facility so then they could take on more people, they could have more time and more capacity to be able to have more carcasses and be able to move them out a bit faster. Trying to take a carcass and putting them into individual cuts is very time consuming. So, and that right now is what most people want. Um, yeah. We've seen a huge increase in people who have freezers trying to sell meat locally and having a pre-packed license, they need to have those those carcasses cut down to individual cuts to be able to sell. And, and uh, 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 Brian, Senator Palmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Julie, I'm just curious, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it. Where are the two uh, slaughter facilities? You mentioned down south, but uh, where are they? So we have one, that, the one that I spoke about that just bought a an old um, building, um, is in Wilmington, which is kind of, it's kind of out of the way, but it's, you know, in that area, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of need for it. So, and I think they're gonna do very well. The other one that we're looking to have, which is being built from scratch is in Alberg. So that's way up on the other side of, of the state. So yeah, two different, oh. two different areas. Yeah, we've had a lot of people ask about um, starting up slaughterhouses. Um, we've given them the education, the regulatory assistance, but it's, they're just not there yet. Um, hoping maybe this spring they'll come back to us. Maybe they'll have something a little bit more concrete that they can work with. Thank you. And what about, um, uh, does VTC, do they still train meat uh, uh, processing? Do they have a training program at VTC? I know Abby and I spoke about this. We had a few meetings with um, the people at VTC and the Department of Labor. So I don't know, Abby, if you want to jump in on that, I believe that was your sister that was. Yeah, so yeah, if I may, Senator, um, VTC does still have the desire and on occasion has run a uh, meat cutting program. The Meat Cutter Apprenticeship Program at VTC um, has not run, at least since the pandemic and, and prior to, due to a lack of a slaughter facility that they could host the training at. So, um, and that's generally just due to slaughter facilities being so busy that they haven't had the ability to designate their space for a training opportunity. So one of the um, CRF requests that we had proposed was to purchase, for Vermont Tech to purchase equipment to be able to on campus yeah. create a, um, training facility with all the meat processing and cutting equipment. Um, that was not supported, but we're hopeful that um, through other federal mechanisms, we can support and help them kind of achieve such a goal. Uh, Department of Labor has been engaged, as Julie mentioned, trying to think about if there's on-job training opportunities at meat processing facilities to help get them um, to a place where they can start working with a skilled workforce and, and do the on-job training at their own plant if they wanted to add more staff or add a yeah. shift. So it's still a need. We, I think we know two things. We know there's a yeah, skilled I could workforce see where, need. Sorry. I could see where a private slaughter facility, though that would, if they were trying to get out me in a hurry, you know, as good, fast as they can. I could see where a training program would slow that process down a great deal. And it would, it would be much better if we could have the equipment at VTC, bring the animal, you know, the slaughtered animals in and, and train them. So then when they do get to the slaughter facility, they'd be ready to go to work. Uh, for cutting and processing, but that is, um, I guess, something that we need to think about and work on. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee in regards to um, uh, Kristen's uh, testimony? If not, uh, we'll move on. I think we're getting uh, towards the end, Senator. We had a couple more to go. Uh, E.B. Flory from our dairy division. E.B., you want to say hi? And uh, E.B. was instrumental in um, getting CARES dollars out to our processors, but also our dairy farmers. So maybe, uh, E.B., if you want to just say hello. 
Yeah. So thank you, Anton, and, and nice to see everyone again, and, and nice to meet you, Senator Parent. Um, I'm Mibi Flory. I'm the Dairy Section Chief at the Vermont Agency of Ag, and I oversee the dairy regulations, both for our, our grade A farms processors, um, and then also our raw milk um, producers. So anything regulation-wise um, and maintaining the federal pasteurized milk ordinance standards so that our Vermont milk and our dairy products are, are eligible to be sold in state and out of state and internationally um, is what uh, my team is tasked with. And we work with, with all sorts of processors and farms of all shapes and sizes, some of them with just three to six animals that have success meeting the regulatory standards and, and have viable businesses up to um, extremely large uh, processors and very, very large dairy farms. Um, through the CARES Act funding, we did have a handful of dairy farmers decide that they wanted to bottle some of their own milk. Um, and each one of these individuals has actually done really well. Um, so it's exciting to see that the, the CARES Act funding went to um, helping them diversify their, their family businesses and um, Two of the farms now are already adding additional pasteurizers and working with our team um, because the demand is, is high from the community. So that's been one positive thing, um, despite us continuing um, to lose dairy farms of different shapes and sizes. Um, we do have people dedicated trying to pivot and find ways to keep the family business going. Um, and we're working with them as much as possible to help guide them and, and and give them all the technical assistance we can so they can hopefully avoid mishaps and, and costly mistakes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, E.B., um, have you been keeping up on, on the issue um, of DFA being allowed to um, keep the Franklin Mass plant and, and that whole situation to make sure that our farmers are getting a fair shake uh, in the milk pricing business because they're gonna, I don't know if it's, it's within, your, um, within your division, but you know, the way I look at that, um, uh, DFA is gonna control about 80% of our milk sales in the future by being allowed to keep that Franklin plant in, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, is there anything on that that you've been tracking? Um, I've mainly, Senator Starr, just been keeping up with um, the news briefs that are coming out from it. And my understanding is that the Justice Department had told them they needed to sell that plant. And if there wasn't a buyer of that plant, they could keep it. And that's what's played out. Um, so we don't have an active role as the agency um, to dictate this in, in bankruptcy court and the purchases they're making. Um, so this is really the Justice Department deciding whether or not them having that plant would make them a, a monopoly or not. So I understand your concerns, but as far as what I've read, um, DFA is going to proceed through with, with keeping that plant. Well, I don't mind them keeping it or running it, but I want to make sure that our, our we ship a tremendous amount of milk into that dairy plant from mm -hmm. up here in my district and probably from all over Vermont. And I want to make sure that our farmers are, are going to be treated well if, you know, independent producers used to send to that plant. And I want to make sure that independent farmers either can ship, continue to ship there or that they have to be paid a fair price for their milk and, and their membership into DFA. But there's nobody, if nobody's watching that, it's not good. Yeah, but anyway. we, we only have three independent farms um, in Vermont and they do all ship to that plant. Um, all of the rest of our farms are, are members of cooperatives or their own, they're, they are their own processor in a farmstead. So um, it's just these three farms. We don't really have control over what their negotiations are in price between um, DFA and I've not been privy to any of the negotiations or, or dollar amounts. 
So, Anson do you, or Steve, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, so, we've been monitoring. We, we, you're, you're right, Senator. That is a critical plant for the for the Northeast, um, and um, and the Justice Department has determined where it's going to land. And we're, we're monitoring that situation. We're also uh, watching closely with these independents, uh, making sure that. Um, um, you know, they have their market and a secure market, and we, we realize that um, it's important that we stay on top of it. And we've had uh, discussions um, both um, with the farmers and also within the agency about making sure that uh, we protect that market for those independents out there that are, um, you know, got, uh, you know are, are a little bit at risk here, so we're trying to protect them. Well, I, I, I would have thought the courts would have had something in in the you know their stipulations that if they did keep and and ha and are allowed to maintain the Franklin plant that they would have to keep these independents as producers. But um, I don't know if it's probably too late for anything like that or not. But the AG and you guys should be should be keeping a very close eye on on that. Um, if, if there are yeah. no other questions, uh, we can, and we'll deal with this um, hopefully in the near future because it's getting to a critical point. Um, who's up next, Dance? I think, uh, uh, I think Senator Polino. Yeah, I just have a quick question oh. that I think I should know the answer to, but I want to be reminded EB, of how much money we spent or sent to the dairy industry, how many, how much care funds went to the dairy industry? Ultimately, Diane, Diane wasn't it uh, just to dairy farmers alone? Wasn't it eighteen close to eighteen dairy, million? Dairy farmers and dairy processors just over eighteen million. Yeah. So less than we had thought we would. Yes, with so, the caps no, that were in with the caps that were in place, that's. But the but the demand as we pull all this information together for our reporting for you early in February, uh, we'll show you what the demand was versus what went out, and the demand was well over fifty million. Um, oh, I see. But all we sent out was eighteen million. I see. Thanks. That might good, be a good time to transition to Diane. Many of you know Diane. Um, she's got great historical knowledge, knowledge at the agency. Um, also across the industry of uh, Vermont with uh, agriculture. So Diane, why don't you say hi? Diane will be your key point when we get into uh, budget discussions as well, but uh, Diane's all yours. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, uh, Senator Parent. Nice to see you. I think we've met before, but um, looking forward to working with you more closely on the Senate Ag Committee. And welcome to all the welcome back to all the committee members. Yes, um, my role with the agency um, is to uh, oversee the things that impact the whole agency, as well as a couple of land use regulatory programs, uh, budget, human resources, all the projects that come out of the governor's office that impact the whole agency are are my responsibility, um, and the budget. Uh, we're working to get that together and look forward to providing that information to you all uh, once the governor does his uh, speech, which we're all uh, looking forward to, to hearing that. So uh, we're pulling the budget together. Um, also, the two land use programs, we're very excited to um, hear that the, the governor is supportive of um, a little change, some changes to Active 50, but one that involves agriculture, looking at the accessory on-farm businesses. Um, the agency of Agriculture has a role in Act 250 with the primary agricultural soils and, and uh, defining the impact and mitigating for that impact on primary ag soils. But also we know that there has been an increase in um, agricultural businesses taking on something else on the farm. Um, it may be, you know, milk to cheese, cider or apples to pie, those kind of things, but it's really starting to expand into um, you know, bringing people to the farm, the see Wedding. it made, weddings, um, events, cross country skiing, all those kind of things where people are coming to the farm. And it is a fine line between that, uh, those activities, those 
commercial activities that mm, may or may not be farming, mm, uh, where that falls with Act 250. So uh, within the governor's recommendation, there's a request to look at the accessory on-farm businesses mm -hmm. and provide some exemptions to those businesses until they hit a threshold of improvements. They've had to build another building or put in a parking lot or something that is a trigger, but when they're just getting started, not, not having them get caught up in the Act 250 world. And many of these small businesses get started, they get going, they're starting to grow, and then they find out past tense, they should have had an Act 250 permit. And that can really, you know, if they've gone out for a bank loan or anything like that, it can really upset the apple cart for these small businesses. So really looking forward to a robust discussion of that with your committee and others um, this coming year. The agency also works on Section 248, the energy siting. It's a little different standard um, of the impacts to primary ag soil. We're supposed to make sure there's no undue adverse impact, which is a legal standing um, about uh, making sure they try to not have as much impact on primary ag soils. So solar is the main one we've been working with. Um, some anaerobic digesters um, and how that for farms as well as now just food waste and or um, municipal sewer sludge uh, anaerobic digesters for that. So a couple of areas uh, that the agency works on and uh, you know the the overall for the agency we very much were deep in on the CARES Act grants and put a lot of work into it. A great team, a really good job done, as Abby said, impacted. We had 33 different people out of 138 working on just CARES grants pretty much from June through December. So that was a deep dive, pulled people away from their regular days, the regular jobs um, to get that money out the door. Um, just to put it into um, context, our annual budget is 28 million and we put over just over 26 million out the door. So almost as much as our annual budget uh, went out the door. So we thank you for your work on that. Um, very glad to get into more detail on all of these subjects if you wish, and uh, look forward to working you, with you during the session. Yeah, uh, thank you, Diane. And um, I'm sure that, you know, all the things that you mentioned, um, you know, whether it's siting of um, energy, um, uh, programs on farmland and fields or uh, on farm uh, businesses uh, where especially uh, composting on farms we're going to need to deal with that uh, especially uh, chicken chicken and all chickens and all those good things um, but anyways uh, thanks and are there questions from any of the committee for Diane no we're Good to go. Um, so, okay. Anson, One, I, think, I, I think our final guest is uh, Steve Collier. Uh, Steve uh, joined the agency. He's been with us uh, just about a year, and thank goodness he was with us uh, over the last few months because he really helped uh, interpret some of the CARES dollars and what could be spent on them and how they could get them out the door. And I know you work closely with you folks on uh, helping to write legislation. So, it's great to have Steve with us. And, Steve, why don't you? Uh, why don't you say hi? Sure. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. And uh, last and least, I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to see all of you again. And Senator uh, Parent, it's very nice to meet you and appreciate you all having us. Uh, my role is general counsel with the agency, which I guess uh, effectively is to try to keep people out of trouble, which is pretty ironic because my mother always said I was a horrible troublemaker. So I, I don't know <laughs> if I can do it or not, but I try. Um, I, I would really like to echo what a lot of folks have already said in thanking you so much for working to get this CARES money into the hands of people that we needed it. I, I did start a year ago, so at the beginning of the last session, and I don't think any of us really anticipated how 2020 would unfold, but it's been a, a great privilege for all of us, I think, to work to get hands into the money of the of the so many Vermonters who needed it or money sorry into the hands of so many Vermonters who needed it and you your committee was absolutely instrumental in helping to construct programs that we were able to administer if you hadn't worked so collaboratively with us and constructing those and funding those we would not have been able to have the success that we did and to be able to help all the Vermonters that we were able to help so we really all appreciate that cooperative relationship. It was terrific. And we look forward to trying to do some more good work this year. So thanks very much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, 
<clears throat> I know I had a little interaction with, with you and Anston and the crew down there. And, um, you know, I really appreciated uh, your thoughts and ideas and the way you presented them uh, being very easy to work with. And uh, so I think you've been a great addition to the ag uh, department or agency, as well as to the people of the state of Vermont that they, they try to help every day. So thanks for, for all your hard work. Well, thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Uh, any other comments or questions from the committee members? Uh, I guess not. Um, Anson? Can yeah, I, I think so. Say, uh, wait a minute. Chris has okay. got a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, for the secretary and the whole team, um, I, yeah. I, I think we have done it, but we, it's worth doing again just to pass along our thanks. It's not easy being a state employee at the best of times and then to have your jobs upended in this sort of crisis, uh, everybody, it, it, to be successful takes everybody pulling in the right direction, yeah. in the same direction. And uh, please do pass along our, our gratitude to, to you, Mr. Secretary, and the whole team uh, for doing just a great job under challenging conditions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Senator. And I, I know as an agency, I think we're closer. And I think what we learned, one of the things we learned, we're closer to our constituents than we've ever been, which is great. And we're learning, we're listening to them. We, we know their needs more than we ever have now because of this um, exchange that we've done working through this program. So I know we're kind of like right at the windshield right now, but now I think as we go forward over the next you know, next few months, we'll look past the, you know, the, the windshield and past the hood and what can we do to really take this rare opportunity to advance the economy and particularly the agriculture economy. And I think we're, we're poised to do that. I think, um, I think we, we've got the data, we've got the information now, we just got to put the puzzle together and I know you'll help us with that. So we're, we're pretty, we're pretty excited where we're going. We know there's, we know there's need out there. We know people are struggling um, and we just got to get to that. You talked to about food insecurity and, and there are some uh, in the, uh, the latest CARES package that's coming up uh, through Washington, there are a number of nutritional programs that are there, uh, right. one for dairy to produce dairy and, 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 um, and then they would go to the food banks. There's also more SNAP benefits. Um, so we continue to work on that. Um, so that will be through USDA. And just a final thought on this latest CARES package, it looks like we will not have the flexibility that we may have had uh, during the last round. So there won't be some discretionary money that the Agency of Agriculture may be able to use to do granting programs. This uh, latest package is pretty prescribed and where it's going to go. A lot of the programs out of USDA uh, right. through agriculture are direct payments either to farmers or the prescribed uh, programs already defined down there. For example, uh, meat processing, there's an element in there that says uh, uh, small or medium farm, medium sized meat processing, they're gonna be granting programs, which I think we need to really, uh, you know, take advantage of and really get in there and do that. But it won't be like, um, you know, the agency is gonna have another granting program. It doesn't look that, that it, it will be that same type of model of lots of money for rental housing, uh, arrearages, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot of with healthcare, vaccine, uh, some of that stuff, but it doesn't look like we're going to have as much discretionary money in this round to, uh, dedicated to agriculture. I just wanted to throw that out there as we try to figure out what's coming up the uh, pipeline from Washington. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank, thank you, Anson. And a question uh, I have, uh, and I've read that about the feds are going to manage their own, you know, through, um, through FSA and their own agencies. Do they have uh, technical people that help our, our farmers or farmers in rural areas? Do they have technical people to help them through that application process? Uh, or is that something that, that we should think about gearing up a little bit for? Yeah, uh, it's hard. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Diane. Um, the USDA offices, yes. The Farm Service Agency, every county, has or that's not true anymore. Uh, the majority of counties in Vermont have um, have uh, offices, and you know, from my family members who took part in the CFAP program, they were on the phone 
and could provide their information by phone um, and and get the get their um, applications in. So they were very accommodating, very helpful at um, USDA Farm Service Agency. They do have people doing that work, um, you know, having those conversations with farmers and and helping them with those applications. So yes, they do. Yeah. Well, they, they, we did, the agency certainly did help get information out with USDA to, to say, yeah. come in, call the office, come to the office. They were open. You could go there um, if, if need be. Yeah. Uh, Abby, you had comment? Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Um, I agreed with what Diane shared. Um, it does seem from the little bit that we know and have heard from SBA is that most of the ag support will be through PPP. Um, funding. They did make some changes to those dollars that will hopefully make it more accessible for um, smaller ag businesses, but it's still based upon payroll uh, reduction and loss. So I think we have a lot to learn. SBA also has staff that can direct and support businesses that have questions. But I will say, you know, we worked very closely with Farm Viability during our Vermont COVID-19 Ag Assistance Program and the, um, I forget what they call their program, their rapid response work that they did um, was incredibly valuable. And Anson gave the statistic of about 400 businesses that applied for and received our VCAP grants received support from Farm Viability. And in our conversation with them, they will not be able to continue that level of work without additional funding. So I just, I'm not advocating for that, but just being clear that they are not in a position. I think there is, there was technical assistance that our agency provided and that that rapid response program provided that um, may look different in this next round of stimulus funds given the, where the dollars are focused. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I heard uh, that uh, Washington's already talking about putting together a, another uh, COVID response uh, bill. And, you know, that, that one may be totally different than, than this one that we're, you know, that we just got. So anyways, uh, I think, uh, you know, with, with Senator Leahy in charge of appropriations uh, in the future, possibly, and, um, you know, there's a good opportunity that something good will come out of come out of Washington that will help our our small businesses. And you know, the PPP program was fine for the big guys to help their payrolls and all that, but little farm, small farms a lot of times live right out of the checkbook, and they don't have a payroll account that they can they can lean on or go back to to try to get help from. So anyways, um, are there any other comments from uh, the committee? If, if not, I uh, wanna thank you all very much for your, your hard work all summer and fall and appreciate your, your time uh, today and, and very much look forward to you know, working with you throughout the winter months. Uh, it's nice that, I mean, it's too bad we can't get together, but we never could anyways in that little closet <laughs> that we work in. And uh, this seems to um, work pretty, pretty well. And um, so uh, anytime that you folks wanna certainly get in uh, where we can, you know, all meet, uh, like on Zoom, um, you know, it's it works pretty, it works pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, we look forward to. Um, well, I'll you. see some of you in the morning, but uh, look forward to working with you uh, during the session.